Radio 1, The Mac Live. Oh, the desert scene is a story of friends and dark nights. You know, a party out in the desert with a generator and three good bands. Very good times, lots of kegs of beer. <laughs> Girls running everywhere and nudity and sex and sand in your ass. <laughs> Drugs and everybody on the same trip, you know. It's a blast on the desert. It, it, it's, it's, it, I can't even explain it. <laughs> it's, it's just wide open. Oh my God, it's beautiful. Huge sky, you can never reach the end of it. You know what I mean? And just, just open space. The Coachella Valley in California's Mojave Desert shields a sprawl of towns, each striving to stand out in the endless brown. Palm Springs nurses a hangover from Sinatra's swinging 60s, while Desert Hot Springs houses its very own midget colony. For those growing up surrounded by such extremes, a regular teenage life demanded irregular measures. I'm Phil Alexander, and for the next half hour, we'll chart the evolution of Desert Rock, a scene which has unearthed some of America's most original bands. Queens of the Stone Age, Fatso Jetson, Caius, and Unida, all playing a breed of rock and roll that grew from a stubborn desire to be different. This is Live at the Sands. Most people look at a desert and say, oh, it looks like a dead place. It's not really a dead place, it's more like a tough place. I've been to a lot of places now where fuck you has its own weight. Like some places you go and people are like, fuck you, no, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You sling that around the desert like someone's going to hit you. Fuck, boom! If the desert people didn't like you, they told you. If they do like you... They kind of like set you free by not fucking with you. The desert rap mentality. Hi, I'm Johnny Cash. Oh, wait, I'm Josh. Formerly of Caius and now in Queens of the Stone Age. The drive of the desert rap mentality is you got to do your own thing. And there's that punk rock do-it-yourself drive. The Coachella Valley, it's revolved around a handful of cities. And half of the cities are resort communities with really wealthy people who come here to retire because of the fair weather and to play golf. And the other half of the cities are full of minorities that are here to like mow their lawns and clean up after them. You go to the, the mall because you got into punk rock and you had three records to choose from. It's not a town for kids. Maybe you could go watch Raiders of the Lost Ark at the movie theater. What is there to do out there in the desert? That's a question that was answered the day I started playing in a band. Out of sheer boredom, you know, start a band. Just for the love of it, play music. It's fun, and it still is. This is John Garcia. I played in Caius. This is Scott Reeder. Played in Across the River and Caius. Rock has been kind of a dirty word in the desert back in the late 60s. There was this big rock festival. Grateful Dead played, and Jimi Hendrix, and Janis Joplin. All these freaks came into town, and you know the uptight older people didn't like it. You know there were a lot of problems. Guy got killed. There were riots. Uh, people went up in the canyons and trashed the place. So after that, you know the city government, the police wanted anything like that to ever happen again so if anybody tries to open a club where there's going to be live music forget it yeah so there's never been a really cool place to play when i first started playing in bands somebody thought of bringing a generator out to the desert and we started having parties out in the actual desert with major cities such as la and san diego a few hours drive away the desert towns were never going to be a regular port of call for touring bands in the mid-80s, Fatso Jetson's Mario Lally, veteran of local punk legends across the river and all-around godfather of the scene, decided to fill this void. Investing in his own portable power, he took his music to Mother Nature's very own amphitheatre. The first time we did it down in the desert, 
I was just got addicted. I, I, I was so excited because it was we we're just so free to do whatever we wanted. Finding a place where you could jam for hours and hours and hours and just get that kind of trip going, you know, and like go for two days straight. So we just get sick of playing, you know. We, we don't have to worry about pissing anybody off. Right when I was first getting into punk rock, I'd heard there were actual real life punk rock bands in the desert. And then it was like you started going and it was so cool, like people you'd see around town that, you know, you, you didn't even realize were like into the same things you were into, but all of a sudden, you know, you guys were all out in the middle of the desert somewhere, 14 years old and getting shit-faced drunk on cheap beer. I was being initiated in live music under the flag of punk rock. And that's when my standard of quality and integrity was set because I walked in and these guys have like long hair and dreads and afros and they're playing like acid rock. But then that's when I understand, whoa, punk rock is about doing your own thing. It's about freedom, expressing yourself, looking the way you feel comfortable, playing the kind of sounds you want to hear. And that quality and that standard of integrity carried on to the music and all the bands that we play in. I mean, I, I've been in the desert nights where the full moon was so luminous that you could read the frickin' Bible. You put down the guitars and, and turn off the generator and it'd be just silent and beautiful out and the weather was, was just awesome and you'd be looking at the sky and the beautiful hills. I mean, we're so far out right now, you can't even make out a house or a building or just all you can hear is the breeze. It's so quiet, you know, it's like, that's what's so rad about coming out here and playing music is like you could bring this like gnarly radical ugly volume of rock to the most pristine silence and just like totally pollute it yeah, you know and it's so beautiful it makes the music so heavy because it's like you put it up against a completely white canvas you know where it's just like it's so quiet so beautiful and then you just pollute it with a radical rock yeah and it's like so loud and heavy out here it's you know blast furnace heat you know it's like about 115 degrees fahrenheit weird smell too at the part like yeah the, the exhaust from like the generator and dirt in the air and like the smell of stale cigarettes and beer and stinky dudes and you have all this space fuck you could fit the whole world out here Parallels between the desert parties and the UK rave scene show that the underground desire to be different, to create, and to just let go is universal. Part and parcel of this freestyle independence is the cat and mouse game between party goers and the authorities. Eventually the police would figure it out. They'd find us, you know, they'd eventually find us. The Highway Patrol started using helicopters and they'd see all the cars and any bonfires that were happening, lights from the bands. So we used to have checkpoints. We'd have everybody meet at a gas station off the freeway, 70 cars. And then we'd just be the flagship, just like leading everyone to the party, just staying a step ahead of the police. The bands often sought new venues to play, and the vastness of the desert made sure the police were always playing catch-up. The Iron Door and Shotgun Flats are spots famous within desert law as homes to some of the biggest parties. Tony Tournay of Fatso Jetson. Okay, this is a place called the Nudist Colony. It's pretty much an old closed down nudist colony that shut down in the late 60s. All that was really left is a volleyball court, uh, a couple buildings, and a swimming pool. You know, the pool was pretty famous. It was a really nice left-hand kidney. On any given weekend, there'd be some of the world's best pro skateboarders up here. Say, Christian Hasoy and, you know, Tony Alva. If skaters lived in Southern California, they all kind of ended up here at one point or another. It ended up becoming a place where we'd end up throwing parties. We'd had a couple generators for the bands to play and two bands going at the same time in different areas. And local bands, Unsound, Sort of Quartet, Yawning Man, Caius. It was just a really mellow vibe. People just getting drunk and hanging out and watching the skating or skating and watching the bands. It's a cool place. Any given Friday or Saturday night, probably four or five hundred people up here and there was what used to be a jacuzzi and that ended up being turned into a fire pit a beacon in the night like if you didn't know what else there was to do you could always look up to the hill and see if there was a light going and if there was you knew something was going on up here 
There's a cool feeling when you're walking up to a party and you hear the noise from a distance. So you hear the sound of a generator and it just keeps growing louder. And then you start to hear the of people talking and a beer cans bouncing off rock. You know what I mean? When you turn the last corner and there'd be fires and people there and you see all the cars and you see the cars you recognize, some you don't parked along the way. It's cool, man. When you play outdoors, if the wind blows, the sound changes. It's like... As you're walking up the canyon, you, you hear it bouncing through the canyon as it twists. 90 degree turns, like... Triple digits Fahrenheit. But wind blowing with sand in it. It's like getting sandblasted. I remember one night it was really, really windy and there were all these bonfires and sparks going everywhere. Real windy, real hot. I went to go have a ice cold sip of beer and I just took a drink and then nothing but sand came out and I was like, oh yeah. <laughs> but those experiences live in my mind forever. In the day, you bide your time, save your energy, and stay out of the sun's way. Nighttime, everything comes out of the woodwork. You hear the howls and the crickets and everything. Things that exist and live out there are tough, and they almost all come out at night. And that's what the parties were, too. You know, I was watching these guys, like, slam dancing. I saw a guy in the middle of the pit with a gun shooting his gun off in the middle of the pit. I mean, that's like par for the course. There weren't any rules, you know. You didn't have some stage manager yelling at you. You didn't have to, like, worry about selling T-shirts or anything. You know, it was just about having fun. Nobody was making any money. Nobody thought even about, like, charging, you know. It was just like, fuck it, man, just hang out and, and play. You come home from that with sand in your hair, sand in your teeth. Your boots are dusty. And, you know, my equipment, take an air compressor and go... Pfft have to blow it all out, but what a Friday. You're listening to LeMac Live on BBC Radio 1. As the desert scene grew, there were attempts to make it more permanent with the opening of new live music clubs around the valley. However, these were always short-lived as it proved difficult to find people willing to part with their cash when every weekend they were watching bands play for free, without the hassle of bouncers asking for ID. The scene remained small, but bands such as Caius, Fatso Jetson and Unsound ensured the music echoing from the canyons was as diverse as that heard in any major city. Mario Lally. Things are a little different around here because you don't have this constant influence of what the trends are in the clubs in L.A. We haven't gotten a chance to be immersed in this music scene. We're kind of influenced by what we want to go out and listen to and not what set in front of us so much. Everything from jazz to hardcore punk rock, you know, experimental stuff. A couple times some industrial bands would bring all their drum machines and sequencers and stuff up here. Yeah, pretty much the whole musical spectrum. It wasn't really broken up into, ooh, who's a punker and who's a, you know, whatever play what you want to play and people would like at least listen might not like you but they wouldn't throw shit at you either it was one of those things where you had to try and come up with something that was your own like if you took too much from one influence you're going to sound just like them so if you take a little from a hundred influences you might be able to create something that you can say is yours so that was something that we, that we tried to do Hey, this is Nick from Queens of the Stone Age. Let's make music that we would want to hear ourselves. That I can't go buy in the store. Ask all these other bands that aren't from the desert if they listen to their own records. And I bet you they won't. Kais used to religiously listen to its own records. And we thought everyone did that. I got to. I'm not doing this because I want to. I have to chasing songs in your head that you like. I mean, it's that simple. So many good bands, but everybody had their own sound. 
You know, I'm thinking if he sounded like anybody else, I would be like, fuck you, you know. You sound like this, you sound like this, you sound like this. It's not a comparison. It's you sound like these guys verbatim. I was like, fuck them. Never again. I will search to the ends of the earth to make sure no one ever says that again. You gotta be different. And that's how we'll get along. If we're the same, we won't get along. These parties have no rules, they have no laws, they have no one in charge. Just like being different and being good was all that's required. So it's all based by the court of public opinion. And you know when you get the nod and when you get the finger, one of them feels good and one of them feels bad. And you're always on the search for the nod. And the nod is about subtleties, you know. Someone doesn't go, that was great, and you guys, blah, blah, blah. It's the nod. And that's all you're ever going to get. Pius and the like, they didn't go out kissing ass. Record deals came to them. It came to them. It came to them because it was an undeniable thing. Caius epitomized the collective middle finger of the desert. Do as you want and not as you're told. Coming on with a whole new kind of heaviness in their music, the quartet of singer John Garcia, guitarist Josh Homme, bassist Nick Oliveri and drummer Brant Bjork recorded their first album, Wretch, in 1991 while they were still in their mid-teens. The desert scene was becoming far more than a local phenomenon as like-minded bands from all over Southern California came to play the Coachello Valley. In the meantime, Caius were broadening their horizons and exploring more traditional music scenes. Grant and Josh. Caius was asked to go play LA. We were like, well, wow, why not? I'm going to the big city. So you walk into LA, we're like, we're here to fuck you up. I'm not gonna let them call us a small town bunch of idiots. We literally got in a fight every time we played. We'd try to get shows with bands that we liked, but we realized we didn't like any. We had nothing in common with these people or the business. But we had honed our craft. We made them bow down. I remember sitting with Brant and being like, this is too weird because it was so foreign to the way we did everything. There's this thing, pay to play. They give you 50 tickets. They want five bucks back for each ticket they gave you, so that's 250 bucks. So they give us 50 tickets and we'd be like, what the fuck are these, throw them away, show up, and they're like, where are those tickets? So, I don't know. We had a couple gigs that we just didn't even play because we're like, forget it. And so I think we had an animosity to that because that isn't required in our scene in the desert. Play for the love of playing. There was no like money attached to it. I went to a show and there were about five people there. They had an original sound, which they were quite proud of and they knew very well what they were doing. To hear a band tuned down to a C or a B, it, it, there was a great rumble to it all. A kind of a jammy fluidity to the music. It swings and it flows and it's not so uptight. It was the feeling that you get in the pit of your stomach and you just know that you're, you're about to get your head slammed in and you sit back and enjoy it. Brothers and sisters, my name is Chris Goss. I play in a band called Masters of Reality, but for the most part, I make rock and roll records for a living. Any desert record you buy, you'll find my name on somewhere, maybe. There was no science to Kai's. It was complete ignorance. I mean, we were just so green, dude, so green. We didn't know. I didn't even know how to take drugs yet. We don't know, are you kidding me? We didn't know, we just played. You just play it. Every human being is influenced by their environment. I always thought the Kaisis thing was kind of wide open, laid back, and hot, and sweaty, sweaty, sweaty. steamy, stinky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what you get in the desert. I knew there was something there. I wanted to make sure that a metal producer didn't get them and uh, make them tune up and tighten up, which I believe would have ruined it. I guess I got involved just to try to preserve what they were doing.
The first record that we worked on was Blues for the Red Sun. Uh, I've been working with Josh Homme now for about 10 years. Caius were finding fans in high places and were soon touring the world opening for stadium giants like Metallica and Faith No More. They recorded two more albums with Chris Goss, Welcome to Sky Valley and The Prophetic and The Circus Leaves Town. But success was taking its toll on the band. Oliveri and Bjork bowed out to be replaced by Scott Reeder and Alfredo Hernandez. The punk rock drive which fueled them was the antithesis of their glossy corporate experience. Josh Homme. We got out of there first by accident. So it made us look responsible for the desert scene, as it were. We so vehemently applied the they theory. What will they say? What will they do? Will they think we've sold out? Punk rock guilt. Caius was ruled by it. I went to a bar out in Palm Desert, and I saw this guy that was in the punk scene in high school that I hadn't seen in probably 10 years, and I was like really glad to see him, and, and I walked up to him, and he's all, ooh, how's Mr. Rockstar? And I was like, ah. Went on these tours, came back, and got a bunch of shit. You know, Seattle was exploding. You know, it's like MTV. That would suck. What if something exploded here? I didn't want to be involved with Caius if that was going to happen. We've always walked around with what we called the button to like make sure that that never was even a possibility. The button attached to a cord that's as long as the earth. And at the other end is a big thing of dynamite with Caius written on top of it. And I mean, when I quit, I went, <laughs> knew I was doing it. We just would gone. We'd done so much more than I ever expected. It wasn't bad, it was good. The Caius implosion ensured their status as one of the world's biggest cult bands. Faced with imminent mainstream success, they turned it down without a second thought, and their fan base has flourished ever since. Back home in the desert, the parties were also feeling the pressure. Mario. Something happened. Something happened in the wrong element found out about these parties. A lot of gangster activity. Then there was stabbing. So then there was shootings. And then it culminated in a fire. A couple guys decided that it would be really good to maybe try to kill everybody and set a fire down next to the main road. And it ended up burning 1,200 acres of the mountain. Bonfires in the middle of this canyon, surrounded by a whole bunch of people, a sea of cars, parked like a jigsaw puzzle. Drunk guys with shotguns and fireworks standing on top of this little cliff in the canyon, shooting shotguns into the air above people. It's amazing something wrong, like really, really wrong, didn't happen. And that was a big wake-up call, like, whoa. We had raped the desert, man. And that's when I stopped going. That's when I pulled the plug. As the chaos faded, the fallout led people in different directions. Fatso Jetson continued to do what they had always done, make music. As did Brant Bjork, who joined coastal Californian cohorts Fu Manchu while Scott Reader quit music altogether to open a pet store. Josh Homme took the spirit in a new direction with the Desert Sessions, designed to recapture the freestyle jams of days past, which really made it onto tape. Homme invited friends from different scenes into the desert, with the premise of making sense of their inspired improvisation. Released through the Man's Ruin label, the proposed series of 12 albums is currently up to volume 6. The Desert Sessions are almost like the final phase of the scene in a way. It, it stopped becoming the scene and it started being this idea. Play music, there are no rules. Merging people have the same idea. And I didn't have a band. And I had a bunch of songs and this band, the Earthlings, kind of came into play. We were on the studio Rancho de la Luna. It's a ranch house on about 100 acres, almost like a museum. 
filled with many beautiful artifacts found at swap meets and thrift stores. Hello, this is David Ketching from Earthlings, Queens of the Stone Age sometimes, and part of the Desert Sessions. Instead of just being a studio in the middle of a warehouse district, this is really beautiful because there's cactus and Joshua trees and road runners running around, tarantulas crawling, scorpions and rattlesnakes and coyotes. It makes it a little more interesting. You'd walk in the door to go visit them and they'd go, great, perfect timing. We're recording a track. Here, take these spoons in there and go play. And you'd go in there and there'd be three other people that didn't know each other, like looking around the room, like, I don't know what we're doing. And they'd have like a coffee cup with a knife and they're supposed to go ding, ding, ding. Well, the Desert Sessions is not a recording session, per se. It's more of a nice dinner party in the desert. Mostly when you're in a recording studio, you're working. And with this, it's more just playing around, having a good time. I just thought the merge of people that I really respected who didn't know each other, to get them to change instruments, improvise music on the spot. I mean, the excuse was that we were going to put it out. But the reason was to see what it would be like to do this. And I'd always wanted someone to ask me to do that. And since no one asked me, I just thought, well, I'll have to do it myself. I think it's a great idea, a focused jam session. When you show up, what's your idea? Well, I got this look. Different people from around here and, and at wherever else. I mean, all kinds of great musicians have been part of that thing. Pete Stahl plays in Goat Snake. John McBain, who played on the first Monster Magnet Records. Black Jesus of the Dwarves. Uh, Chris Goss. Just very loud. Everyone kind of coming by. Aliens. Saying hello. Alfredo Hernandez, Nick Oliveri, Jesse the Devil Hughes of the Eagles of Death Metal. And having a drink and then picking up an instrument and adding drink. something to a song. Ben Shepard, who's in Soundgarden. Very loose and very friendly and, and a very cool thing to have happened. It's like up at around 40 people, a group of freaks. In cities, you don't usually see every constellation of every star in the galaxy. But out there, I, I think that the vibe is definitely created by the beauty of the nature. And it's really nice to record vocals outdoors at about 4 in the morning. You get a really nice sound. Just drifting all over the whole valley. valley. They're still going on, you know. I'm just trying to look for a space to do them. I'm up to six, and this will be seven and eight. And it's going to, you know, be some Foo Fighter boys and some some folks from Lean and uh, Mark Lanigan and Chris Goss. It's going to be really cool. I, I think it's going to be really eclectic and varied. And it seems like an experiment. You know, I mean, I hope people like them, but if they don't, that's okay, too. Caius was so closed to the outsiders of the music business and other musicians, like we refused to jam with anyone else, and the Desert Sessions was so open. That's what I love about this. And that's how it ended up being with Queens and why Queens is so open. The continuously blurred lineup of Queens of the Stone Age epitomizes the politely incestuous relationship between the Desert Bands. Realising that success does not necessarily compromise spirit and integrity, the doors to the desert have come ajar. More Sunday revelations are set to follow the Queen's hugely acclaimed album, Rated R. A revived force in Unida, Scott Reader and John Garcia are set to release their major label debut this summer. Fu Manchu's Grant Bjork has established himself as one third of desert supergroup Che while Fatso Jetson continue to live and record in the desert at their own leisurely pace. The desert parties may be taken to more conventional venues these days, however, the true measure of their success will always remain in the ability to be different. Nick Oliveri. I think that what's popular today isn't what we're doing. I think we all share the same vibe as far as like, just not giving a shit, you know, about what anybody says. Integrity is about the music, it isn't about the success that you have. I give praise to guys like Josh that have been successful while maintaining integrity and never changed a thing. 
where they could have put on the fucking Adidas and played the game and got some shithead to rap. I've never had a party like the parties that have been had in the desert, ever. And I party every fucking day. <laughs> we try to go into wherever we're playing, whatever venue, with the same attitude, like thinking of it as a party. As long as you're having a good time, it's all right with me. <laughs> Bring it out to the world more. And open it up to everybody more. Less of a reclusive little desert boys club.